I'm going to get right to the reading. Thought transference. Now the subconscious mind belongs to no one man alone, for in it and through it all things live and have their beings. Since it is infinite, it is indivisible and therefore irrevocably one, and thus all life is tied together by an invisible but powerful bond. The principal experimental method and tool which we may grasp this is thought transference. Secondly, and nearly important, is intuition. Thought transference is that phenomenon whereby one person may grasp another person's thought without any apparent means of communication. Experiences, experiments along these lines have been conducted for many years more recently under the surveillance of trained scientific minds and the occurrence of phenomenon is indisputable. Original tests put subjects in different parts of the same building, one to transmit the picture of a simple drawing, the other to attempt to capture this picture and draw it with pencil on paper. Though results were far from perfect, they far exceeded any possibility of pure chance or coincidence, and even where the receiving subject was obviously an error, there was generally sufficient resemblance in his drawing to that of the picture held by the transmitting subject as to assure that a certain rapport had been actually established between the minds of these people. Separating these objects by miles, continents, and oceans has made no difference in the percentage of successes against failures. Thought transference exists. That the human mind does not grasp it per perfectly is only testimony to the fact that the conscious mind has imperfect contact with the universal subconscious mind. It is simple for thought transference to take place across 3,000 miles of ocean as it is for it to span several feet of space. For the universal subconscious mind exists in only one place, which is all places, and there can be no distances or space within it. Intuition reveals an all-knowing mind. Intuition is that aspect of mental power which enables a person to contact certain aspects of the subconscious mind with ease. In most cases, this phenomenon might be summed up as an intuitive grasp of universal law. Mathematical prodigies are cases in point. Act such a one for a cube root of 21, which is 9,500 and to, or should I say 95200 zero, zero, and he answers immediately with 280. He does not stop to figure this, to factor, to add, to subtract, to multiply, to carry. The answer is apparent to him. It is apparent because he sees the law and the law automatically yields the answer. There's nothing mystical or occult about this. Since the universal subconscious mind knows everything, it does not figure out anything. The answer is synonymous with the question. Intuitively, the mathematical prodigy is in contact with the subconscious mind, and he sees immediately with the posing of the problem exactly what the answer is. Musical prodigies are similarly intuitive. Music follows the same universal law as mathematics, a fact that may be difficult to assimilate even though we know that math mathematicians who can't sing a note and then some of the math mu musicians to whom a problem in short division poses its own brand of terror, but the law is the same. The bottom line is to understand the key. The key is that the characteristics of this great mind becomes apparent under deep hypnosis. It acts as if it can make anything without doubt, without wonder, without fear, without hesitation. Though hypnotic experiments have not yet gone so far, there's little doubt but what the subconscious can do, exactly what it undertakes to do, for it knows everything and everything exists within it, and its only movement is to change the arrangement or apparency of its own substance. The success of thought transference is increased many times under hypnosis. The intuitive grasp of universal law is increased many times by the same. The hypnotized person can, with vastly increased effectiveness, read the thoughts of other minds 
and answer problems where he has no known understanding. The methods of reasoning. As science knows, the reasoning methods of the mind of man, they generally come under two main classifications, inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. Now, inductive reasoning means to reason from a, the particular to the general. For example, given an, an individual cat that can see at night, inductive reasoning sets out to prove that all cats can see at night. Deductive reasoning, on the other hand, given the premise that all cats can see at night, will arrive at the conclusion that a particular cat in a particular place at a particular time can see at night. In other words, inductive reasoning observes a specific occurrence and attempts to arrive at a general law to cover all such occurrences. Deductive reasoning is already in possession of the general law and uses this law to, de to determine what may happen in specific circumstances in which the law is involved. It is apparent that inductive reasoning knows circumstance and seeks the law, while deductive reasoning knows the law and seeks the circumstance. So what that means is by inductive, or should I say deductive reasoning, you create your own circumstance because you know how becoming what is called the effect of your own cause and knowing how to, by thought, stop something from occurring by what you focus upon by focusing on only all good. Therefore, you see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil, because you know that it is, it is illusionary and that it is transitory and the fact that all things change first in reference to the external from the inside out. The subconscious mind reasons only de deductively. It cannot reason inductively because it already knows all law. It seeks only to determine the circumstance from its complete knowledge of the law. This characteristic of the subconscious mind that it reasons only deductively, that it therefore has in its possession the full knowledge of all governing law, is an indisputable proof that it is the infinite substance, God in man, the ultimate or absolute of all creation. It is obvious that the individual's complete use of his mind will provide him with all the power of creation. Let me say that once again, because I know this is pretty deep right now. Deductive reasoning knows the law and seeks the circumstance. The parallel can be seen immediately. Man knows circumstance and seeks the law. The universal subconscious mind knows the law and seeks the circumstance. The subconscious mind reasons only deductively. It cannot reason inductively because it already knows all law. So it doesn't really seek anything because it has everything. So what you're supposed to do is to learn how over time and by focus and by faith, how to access the subconscious mind so the subconscious mind works for you not against you in reference to default because you just don't know your own internal power this characteristic of the subconscious mind that it reasons only deductively that it therefore has in its possession the full knowledge of all governing law is an indisputable proof that it is the infinite substance god and man the ultimate or absolute of all creation. And it is obvious that the individual's complete use of his or her mind will provide him or her with all the power of creation. The subconscious responds to suggestion alone. The great enlightening truth with which hypnosis has provided us is that this universal subconscious mind responds entirely to suggestion. In other words, this subconscious mind attempts to create and form and substance that which the conscious mind suggests to it. This subconscious mind does not direct man as a robot or automaton or visits disaster and suffering upon him given his, or should I say, let me read that once, once again. The subconscious mind does not direct man as an automaton or visit disaster and suffering upon him, or governs his life. Indeed, it is the servant of man and does exactly what man tells it to do. 
The thing is, how do you get it? How do you get the subconscious mind to do what you tell it to do consistently to create the life you want and how to place yourself in that position? To illustrate this towering conception, let us go back to the young man who was cured of elephant hide through hypnosis. What did the hypnotist say to him? He said, your left arm is clearing up. That only. He did not enter into a series of whys and wherefores and ifs and buts. He simply said, your left arm is clearing up. Forthwith, the left arm cleared up. It is ridiculous in its simplicity. The young man himself could not say my left arm is clearing up and have any healing take place at all. Why? Because he was in complete rapport with himself when he said my left arm is clearing up. He was simultaneously thinking I've been this way all my life. There's no hope. It is impossible to cure this hideous skin by simply saying words. I see this ugly skin before me and it is there and I know it. So what did his subconscious mind receive? It simply received the young man's conviction that he had an ugly skin, which continued to manifest in reality. For the subconscious mind always acts, and it acts on those thoughts behind which there is most conviction. Perhaps you are thinking that it would be a wonderful shortcut to simply put yourself in the hands of a qualified hypnotist and have him solve all the problems of your life by planning the proper suggestion in your subconscious mind. It is true that any immediate problem of yours might well be solved in this matter, but it is certain that you would not relish the necessity of running to the hypnotist every time you were faced with a problem for the rest of your life. No psychiatrist or hypnotist that can live for you, and it is unlikely that you would want him to even if he could. Thus, this is your life. You will live it to its fullest possibilities only when you are able to consciously exercise the great power that belongs to you. You cannot live by proxy and live you must. The only answer is to arrive at understanding of the mighty forces of which you are part of this moment, this minute, this second, and of which you are a part forevermore. Hypnotism you can and may practice either a subject or practitioner, but you will make a grave error if you regard it as anything else than an experiment. It is only one small facet of the study of the universal mind and its principal use to us at this moment is to show us beyond all doubt that the universal subconscious mind responds to suggestion alone. Meditation affirms suggestion. Thus, our primary tool in attaining all our desires is the use of meditation. In meditation, we are simply affirming certain suggestions to the subconscious mind. We are simply repeating and affirming certain thoughts with faith and conviction so that they will be acted upon by the infinite intelligence. It is true that our percentage of success will be low at first. For even as we affirm, we deny. Even as you settle yourself for your daily meditation, affirm the good as to come into your life, certain negative doubts ingraining your thinking over the years will tend to project themselves into the subconscious and thus negate all your affirmation. The prompters themselves are difficult enough to overcome, and habits of ne negative thinking make the problem of successful meditation all the more difficult. While the hypnotist might cure you of a specific illness in several sessions, you yourself undertaking the same cure may find it takes you several months or even a year. But don't be misled into seeking solution through hypnotism unless your problem is so acute and time of such essence as to forbid any other procedure. For only by solving your own problem, only by attaining control and understanding of your own power, will you be truly master of your own life. Even as chronic illness keeps you running to doctor after doctor, so will the solving of your problems by hypnotism keep you running to hypnotist after hypnotist. Now this fact we must make very clear. 
If your appendix is ruptured or your leg broken, the person for you to see is a doctor. If an acute neurosis is leading you into intense melancholy or depression or displacement of personality or any psychotic behavior that may be dangerous to yourself or society, the person for you to see is a psychiatrist. When a physical event or sex circumstance has reached its acute stage and the life or welfare of the individual is seriously threatened, the event or circumstance must be dealt with on the physical plane. Doctors and psychiatrists will play an important role in human welfare for many years to come, but the day will arrive when mankind understands that all physical circumstance originates on the plane of thought. Let me say that again. All physical circumstances originate on the plane of thought. All physical circumstances originate on the plane of thought. All physical circumstance originates on the plane of thought. And that day, each person will stand individual centennial against all disease and all emotional suffering, and they will disappear from our world. Tomorrow.